precious garland, and uh, based on this book, which is a commentary by my teacher, uh, Kenzer Jampa Tekchok, and I had the privilege um, of taking his oral teachings and making them into a book. And it was quite an experience. I did it uh, during one of the winter retreats at the Abbey, so that I was just completely all day working on this text. And wow, <laughs> you know, uh, when your mind is completely, you know, into something like this, it has a very strong impact on the mind. And uh, I always liked Nagarjuna before that, but especially afterwards, you know, because you really see his brilliance. So uh, I always like starting with a little bit of meditation so we can calm our minds before having the talk. And then we'll have a talk and some Q&A and a lunch break and then more in the afternoon. OK. So uh, have your feet flat on the floor if you can. And your hands the right on the left. It's in your lap. Thumbs touching. <coughs> Lower your eyes. Keep your head upright, but not tilted up. And check in with your body. See if there's tension anywhere. If so, release it. Just feel your body sitting here on the cushion and bring your mind to where your body is. You know, if we are contemptuous, if we are condescending, if we threaten people, uh, they won't really want to work with us. Or even if we coerce them so that they're afraid and they go along with our policies or our way, uh, they still aren't very happy and it comes out. Witness the White House. Yeah, very good example of it. Yeah. Lead, being a good leader means that you have to inspire people to go forward towards something that is good, that they're excited about. Being a good leader is not crushing people and being condescending. Okay? It's trying to, to really bring out the best qualities of the people that you're working with. So the, there's a verse here that says, Be generous, speak gently, be beneficent, act with the same intention that you wish from others. Through these actions, bring together the world and also sustain the Dharma. It's, it's four lines, but there is so much in this verse, and that's what we'll be unpacking here for a while. Okay. So it's talking about um, if you act in these ways with generosity, gentle speech, being but beneficent, and acting with the same sincere intention that we wish from others, we act sincerely with them, then through that um, we bring together the people that we encounter and not only do we bring people together in harmony, but we also sustain the Dharma. Okay? And so this is in the context of the king who is ruling a Buddhist country, who, um, you know, who is responsible for embodying Buddhist principles as the leader. Okay, so this starts out with a, a section on training in the four means of attracting others. Okay. So in the long rim, do you remember where this section comes? 
Where does the section come? On, huh? It's pretty early on, as I recall. No. The section on how, how to attract others and get them interested in the Dharma. It's the very end. Not in totally the very end. Where does it come? Huh? No. Generosity. No. It actually comes, uh, you know, because we generate bodhicitta, and then there, then we act with bodhi, the bodhisattva conduct. So acting with bodhisattva conduct has the six perfections and the four ways of us, of attracting people. Okay. So this is in the section right after the explanation of the six perfections, but before the big section on how to develop uh, serenity, meditative concentration, and insight into emptiness. Okay, well, I'll keep quizzing you. <laughs> okay, so to guide the minds of others <clears throat> to the Dharma, Attract them, one, by being generous and giving them material support. So in addition to practice, uh, in addition, practice the generosity of fearlessness by protecting them from danger and the generosity of love by offering emotional support and counseling. By making others happy in these ways, they will be friendly and attracted to you, which gives you the opportunity to do the second one. But I want to talk a little bit about the first one. So the first one is being generous. Okay? So you you give people things and that attracts them. Um, the Christians have been doing this for a long time and converting a lot of people because of it. They go into poor areas, they give material, and then the people feel grateful and join the church. Buddhists should do more of this too. Not for the purpose of you know, necessarily you know, converting people, but really reaching out and uh, help, you know, being active in society and in being charitable and helping others in, a, in a, quite a manifest way. So there's the generosity of material, the generosity of fearlessness, which protects living beings, from danger, so that could involve helping travelers, it could involve becoming a sanctuary city that, uh, you know, doesn't allow ICE, the, the federal government, to, to track down people who have overstayed their visas um, or who are undocumented upon entry. Uh, it, it involves also saving insects that are floating in swimming pools or buckets of water left outside. So, you know, all sorts of different ways of protecting beings who are in fearful situations. Another kind of generosity is, off, is the generosity of love or emotional support. And so this involves counseling, talking to your friends, you know, um, because people are always having problems, aren't they? And so they come to you with their problems, and you speak about the Buddha Dharma without using any Tibetan, Sanskrit, Pali vocabulary, because so much of the Buddha's teachings is just practical stuff, you know, that anybody from any faith or no faith can put into practice and benefit from. And so, you know, all the teachings on anger, the teachings on, uh, you know, apologizing and forgiving, the teachings on overcoming clinging and attachment. So, uh, you know, so many personal problems are, are due to the afflictions, and the Buddha's teachings contain the methods to do that. So you can, to overcome those, so you can kind of when you're talking with your friends and they're telling you their problems, you can talk about these things, yeah? Uh, and you don't have to, they don't even know it's, it has anything to do with Buddhism, yeah. They don't know, they don't have to know. We 
talk about what benefits sentient beings. Okay, so that was the first of the four. And if we do that, okay, then others will be friendly and attracted to us. And then that gives us the opportunity to do the second one, which is to speak to them in a pleasant way about the Dharma by instructing them in the causes for higher rebirth and the highest good. Okay? So if we uh, can attract people to us and they like us, then we can actually start introducing them to the Dharma. So the two topics that are mentioned here, the, um, the highest good, the first one, how, was, how do we translate it? The higher, uh, higher rebirth and highest good, okay? So those two themes, higher rebirth and highest good, encompass kind of everything to do on the path. So our long-term aim is the highest good, which is liberation and full awakening. But to accomplish that long-term gain, that long-term aim, we need a series of good rebirths because it's going to, you know, they say, aspire to attain awakening in this life, but don't count on it. Okay? In other words, have a long-term view you know, then we're going to have to practice over many lifetimes, but we need to have good rebirths in order to continue to practice. So that's what higher rebirth is about, is about keeping good ethical conduct so that we can have a good rebirth. Yeah, and ethical conduct is really, I mean, that's the, the principal cause of good rebirth, keeping good ethical conduct abandoning the ten non-virtues, practicing the ten virtues, and so on. Okay, So there's a lot in that. I won't go into that right now. Um, but, you know, really to do some clear introspection on our own lives and how well we're doing in terms of abandoning the, the ten non-virtues, which are, the three physical ones are, Killing, stealing, unwise and unkind sexual behavior. Then four verbal ones, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle talk, okay. And then three mental ones, which are coveting of other people's stuff, ill will or malice, plotting your revenge, and wrong views, okay? So it's always good to, you know, keep doing a life review, looking at these things. You know, I've done all ten of those. So that means, you know, uh, need to do a bit of purification here, okay? And so, because if we don't purify the karma, then there's a likelihood of a bad rebirth. And once we have a lower rebirth, it's very difficult to have a good rebirth again um, because it's hard to create virtuous karma, you know? So uh, I always talk about our cats at the Abbey as an example of this, okay? We have four cats now. The, the original residents of the Abbey were me and two cats. Some of you here knew Achala and Manjushri. <laughs> um, but they, they both died and had pretty remarkable deaths. Um, and now we have four cats which, who are named after the four immeasurables with the Sanskrit names. So Maitri, or love, Karuna, compassion, Mudita, or joy, and Upeka, equanimity. So these are our four cats. Yeah. So we named them that so they had something good to aspire towards. Yeah. Uh, but it's really difficult as a cat to create virtue. You know? We talk to them all the time about not killing bugs. <laughs> yeah. 
and not Kelly mice because they like to escape through the door and then you know we live in nature so there's lots of mice and moles and voles and squirrels and chipmunks you know so we try and keep them indoors but they go out they escape sometimes and even indoors there's you know stink bugs we have beetles and flies and you know everybody comes to the abbey <laughs> yeah uh, so we try and teach our cats some ethical conduct yeah and um, you know just the other night my tree was chasing a moth and you know I caught her and, you know I try and say my tree they want to live as much as you do you know don't hurt them and she looks at me like you know huh <laughs> so you know just the kind of the foundation of Buddhist practice learning to become a good person very difficult for a cat yeah so uh, we don't want to have a rebirth like that and even though our I mean our cats have a good deal for cats I mean they don't suffer for anything so they have um, and they're pampered my goodness but so in terms you know we talk about throwing karma and completing karma in terms of throwing karma the karma that ripens uh, in the rebirth that you attain our cats didn't do so well they have they're born as cats they don't have the intelligence to understand the Dharma in terms of completing karma that sets up the circumstances in which you live they hit the jackpot you know I mean they, they have 15 people who pamper them uh, you know 16 17 people who pamper them um, you know they don't lack for food uh, they have their little toys I'm sure some of you at, at home have pets that are equally pampered you know with the same karmic thing you know the completing karma was great but the throwing karma was rotten so um, you know this is something to be careful about so um, when we do this second activity of speaking about the Dharma to others we the first thing to emphasize is about karma and how to create virtue and abandon non-virtue and purify non-virtue you know and then to talk about the causes of the highest good of liberation and full awakening okay so that's that's the second way of attracting others the third one is to be beneficent by encouraging others to practice the Dharma and implement the teachings that you have given them okay so we not only talk about the Dharma to people but we encourage them yeah so you bring your friends to Dharma class you invite them to retreat uh, you practice together yeah, this is a, a really nice way to help your friends and also your family members yeah. many people uh, ask me you know oh my family member died you know how do I help them and I give them things to do after you know for the deceased but I always say the best way to help your family members and your good friends is while they're alive and to do that by encouraging them to create virtue to be generous to keep good ethical conduct and so on okay I had one friend who uh, her sister was a Jehovah's Witness so I'm sure you've had experience with Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, and so my friend what she did is she left a Buddhist book just like on the coffee table in the house and uh, after a while her sister came to her and said you know I picked up that book you left on the coffee table and what you guys are doing a lot of it is the same thing we believe 
you know, being generous, being kind, being compassionate, forgiving. Yeah. So for my friend, this was like fantastic because before she couldn't communicate with her sister about religion and then just through leaving a Dharma book on the coffee table, something really changed. Some of you may have may remember many, many years ago, back in the when was it? In the eighties, late eighties, like nineteen eighty-nine, nineteen ninety-one, um there was one member of DFF. They used to call her Hellfire on Wheels. She worked for FAA. She had lupus, so she was in a wheelchair. That were her wheels. And she had red hair and a temper. <laughs> so at her workplace, she was known as Hellfire on Wheels. And uh, she started coming to, to DFF and our weekly meetings. And uh, practicing the Dharma. And these were in the days when all the teachings were recorded on, um, on cassette tapes. You know, kind of. So. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can even play cassette tapes anymore. Um, but she gathered, uh, I taught the Lam Rim, and we had a series of like 157. Uh, tapes from going through the long rim, and she got all the tapes. She had them in her workstation at FAA, and she would listen to them, uh, you know, on break. And she had uh, a picture of the Dalai Lama there. And uh, one of her colleagues came in one day and said, "You know, you've really been changing over the months. It used to be, you know, you used to have quite a temper." And you're so much more mellow now. What have you been doing? And she told him about coming to the DFF teachings. And then this guy, who was completely, you know, he didn't know anything about Buddhism, uh, he said, can I borrow some of those tapes and, and listen to what it is that you're learning about that's helping you to change so much? I thought that was a really cool story, you know? Okay. And then, um, so the, the third one to, to be, was to be beneficent by encouraging others to practice. And then the fourth was to act in a way that accords with what you have instructed them to do. In other words, practice what you preach and tame your own body, speech, and mind. So this is the final proof of the pudding, you know? Like, if you teach something, you, you may not be a, a totally fantastic practitioner, but you have to at least try, you know? You may not be a Buddha and able to practice everything, but you have to at least keep good ethical conduct and try and be a nice person and not yell and scream at people. Okay. And that brings us into the whole topic of ethical conduct um, in Buddhist groups. And it brings us into the topic of the Me Too movement. Yeah. And when and it brings us into the topic of just looking at how people are acting in this country now. And, you know, ethical conduct is not a popular thing in the country. Um, if you can lie, I mean, we're looking at Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. You know, you lie, you steal, you cheat people. You're not going to get caught. You do whatever you want until you get caught, you know. And then you see people like this who are high power, high status people in society who should be the ones who set the example for everybody else of good ethical conduct. And, you know, they're lying through their nose. Is that what? They're lying through their teeth? Through their teeth. They're lying any way they can. Okay? And 
you can see it in the charges brought against them and the convictions, okay? And then, you know, again, the leaders who should be setting the example for, uh, you know, for proper sexual conduct. You know, we have the, 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 <laughs> the chief groper of the world. Yeah? yeah? yeah. <laughs> the president of groping, the president of sexual assault. <laughs> I mean, it's astounding. You know? And then again, we see you know high people in all sorts of different fields getting called out for this. I just uh, spent the last five days at a, uh, a, a monastic gathering that we have every year, um, where monastics from all the Buddhist traditions, Westerners and mona uh, Asian monastics who are living in the West, who are English speaking, uh, we gather together and we, we talk about you know, our practice, we talk about the Dharma, we talk about what's happening in the Buddhist world for five days. And it's not a conference, it's just a group of friends gathering together to talk about things of mutual interest. And it's totally wonderful, and I really, um, you, you leave feeling very hopeful and very inspired, particularly because here are people from all sorts of different Buddhist traditions coming together and being harmonious and sharing. Yeah? And this is remarkable, you know, because in Asia they didn't do that. They didn't have the transportation means that we have. They didn't have the, you know, communication means. And so now here in this country we have all sorts of different Buddhist groups. And here the monastics are coming together and sharing in harmony. And it's wonderful. I mean, it gives you really a lot of hope. But one thing that came up during this was the Me Too movement and the sexual misconduct of some Buddhist leaders. You know, so some of the sexual conduct was with monastics. Some was with lay teachers, the most recent scandals have that I've heard about have mostly been with lay teachers, but it does, you know, harm is harm. It doesn't matter who do, does it. What I did, if I can go off on a tangent here, okay, um, I was looking on the web. Somebody recommended me to the work of Jason Katz, K-A-T-Z, and um, he talks about sexual assault. And he, he, he says, you know, we usually think of this as a women's problem. And he says it's not a women's problem, it's a man's problem. Because the men are the chief perpetrators of it. You know, not only to women, but to girls and to young boys, to children. And he was saying how our language makes the men in, uh, invisible about this issue. So he starts out with, we may usually say, like, Joe assaulted Mary. Joe's the subject, the intention is on, attention is on him. But we don't keep it with Joe assaulted Mary. We then go to Mary was assaulted by Joe. That sentence structure puts the emphasis on Mary. And Joe's at the end of the sentence. From there, it goes just to shorter, Mary was assaulted. Joe isn't even mentioned. Okay? So he says, you know, when this happens, then it makes it look like it's a woman's problem. Because the language just says, you know, women are assaulted. And he says this is a man's problem. And it has to be, the attention in society has to be drawn to the men who are the perpetrators because they are the ones that need to correct it. And then he calls on men um, because not all men are sexual 
set assault women, you know, that's not true at all, it's just a certain subgroup. But he calls on the ones that really have good ethical conduct to be leaders when they're in groups of men. So that if men start telling dirty jokes, they start deprecating women, they start talking about their sexual conduct, conquests, that the men in the group stand up and say, you know, they're acting as leaders, and they say, this way of talking and this way of treating women does not go. You know, we have to change it. And I thought, uh, you know, that's, I'm giving you a five minute encapsulation of his work, which is much longer. But I thought, you know, he's really got it. And, and I like his suggestion because as we can see, when women speak up, Kavanaugh, you know, it became a justice. And, uh, you know, the other guys had already made up their minds before she even testified that they didn't believe her. And even if her, her testimony was feasible, uh, it didn't matter. Yeah? So when women speak, and I was so impressed by how many women spoke up during those two weeks in the press. I mean, women from all walks of life were prominent figures in American society. Even Ronald Reagan's daughter, you know, wrote a piece about how she was raped in the office of an executive. <coughs> you know, and, little, and then all these other people telling their stories. Uh, and the men just in the Senate, at least the Republican men, just, you know, kind of shined it on. And so that's where you need somebody to stand up and say, you know, hey guys, we got to listen here. And this is our problem. It's not the women's problem. Yeah. So, um, you know, you have it in the Catholic Church. We have it, things in Buddhist groups. Um, so it's, it's important to, to speak about this. Uh, in an open, frank way, yeah, without anger, which is the hard one, but you know it needs to be brought up and discussed and worked on. Okay, so that fourth one was you know practice as you preach. Yeah, so I gave this one example. Um, yeah. But it applies to everything else, you know. But just, you know, if you're going to tell other people to be honest, be honest. If you tell other gonna people not to have temper tantrums, try and control your own temper tantrums. You know, that kind of stuff. Okay. With kindness as your motivation, guide others into the Dharma. Because you embody the four ways of attracting others, on the worldly level, sentient beings will practice the 16 factors leading to higher rebirth, and on the ultimate level, they will create the causes for liberation and awakening. In this way, ripen the mind streams of others. So when we talk about ripening the mind stream, it means um, helping, creating the circumstances so that people can learn the Dharma and their previously created karmic seeds can act as a support so that they then can gain Dharma realizations. Okay, so that they become more interested in Dharma and they practice and they gain realizations. That's the meaning of ripening somebody's mind. Okay. Then next verse, a single truth uttered by kings make their subjects have firm trust in them. Likewise, one falsehood on their part is the best way to lose that trust. Yeah? So maybe, you know, in ancient times, people wouldn't tolerate one lie, one untruth, like the verse says. Now we 
tolerate people tolerate a lot of them. You know, it's really rather unbelievable. Um, but the point is here, regardless of what our politicians do, we need to act better, okay? And, you know, it's this whole thing. If we're going to tell them that they need to be more honest, we need to be more honest, okay? So it's not just a thing of screaming about the, the high-powered people in society while we do the same thing. It's about changing our own behavior. Okay. So to realize in our own personal context, yeah, if we tell the truth, other people trust us. If we lie, sometimes one lie, it devastates uh, you know, the trust between people. And we know that trust takes a long time to build up, doesn't it? You know, to really trust people, we have to know them for a while and build that up. And telling the truth is one way of building up trust. And it's an important way. Yeah. Now, uh, telling the truth, this came up in a group I was talking to not recently. Tell, telling the truth doesn't mean, um, you know, your grandma invites you for dinner and cooks exactly the food you can't stand and then asks you, how do you like the food? So telling the truth doesn't mean saying, Grandma, I can't stand this, you know? <laughs> okay. What she's really asking is, I love you and that's why I invited you over. So you respond to that question and you say, Thank you for, for inviting me. I know you cooked this food, you know, because you care about me and I also care about you. Yeah. So, you know, so <laughs> the discussion I had with people, somebody was saying, well, if I don't like somebody, should I just tell the truth and say to them, hey, I don't like you? I said, no. You know, that's not telling the truth. Can you imagine going into your workplace? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen if you tell the people you don't like that you don't like them? That's not going to go over well. Okay? You know, so I said, that's not telling the, you know, that's not the meaning of telling the truth. Okay? You, there's ways to, you know, break the ice between you and try and build up a better relationship. But the, the point here is, that trust takes a long time to build, and trust requires honesty and truthfulness to build. But one lie can shatter many years of building up trust. Okay? And lots of times I wonder why people lie. You know, these little white lies that we tell, sometimes I think they aren't necessary. You know, somebody asks you, um, you know, if you want to meet them after work one <coughs> evening or when you want to go somewhere. And actually you're tired and you want to stay at home. But you don't say that. You say, oh, I already have another appointment because you think that won't hurt their feelings. Why can't you just say, you know, I'm really exhausted and I need to rest? Yeah? Is somebody going to be offended? I, w I was trying to meet a friend here in, uh, in Seattle. I'm only here a short time. And, uh, and he, he wrote, and he said, uh, he, it's a monk, and he said, um, my meditation is doing really well, and if I uh, spend an evening talking, I'm going to lose that energy. And as you know, we have to do it, keep the energy every day. So, please excuse me, well, let's meet another time. And I said, I completely understand. It's like, his meditation's going well, fantastic. You know, that's more important than us having, talking about Dharma, you know? So, uh, yeah, so really won't be offended over, you know? And then uh, sometimes, um, but, but I know for myself, yeah, if people lie to me, 
You know, I don't trust them afterwards. Uh, I really don't. And it, uh, because to me, when people lie, it means they don't trust me. It means they think that I'm not strong enough to hear the truth. And to me, that is insulting, you know? To think that, you know, you're assuming I'm gonna cry or I'm gonna get angry and scream at you because you tell me that. Give me some credit, okay? I can hear the truth. So other people may be more upset about lies for other reasons, but for me, this is, this is you know, my reason. And, uh, you know, you can really see that uh, truthfulness is the way to establish trust. Yeah? But again, truthfulness doesn't mean saying everything you think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also have to be courteous. And as we'll, we'll get to, I'm not sure if it's, because it, in this book, uh, Nagarjuna brings up the topic of truth again and again. It comes up many times in this book. But he makes clear, I'm not sure if it's in this section or another one, that telling the truth means not only saying what is factually accurate according to our understanding, but it is said with a benevolent motivation. If you say what is factually true with a motivation to hurt somebody, that is not speaking the truth, according to Nagarjuna. Okay? So, because lots of times we may tell somebody the truth, but our motivation is to hurt them, to get revenge, to make them feel bad. Yeah, that's not telling the truth, even though what we say may be factually accurate. Yeah. So it has to be with a good motivation. So he continues on about truth here. To speak the truth is to speak in a manner that is not deceptive. It is not what is in fact distorted by an intention. A statement is true by being of benefit to others. The other kind of statement is false since it is not beneficial. Okay, so that here's, it is in this section where he's saying the truth is only the truth if it's spoken to benefit somebody. Okay, so Geshe Tekchuk says, well, Nagarjuna is direct, directly addressing the king as a leader. His advice also applies to us because we are in leadership roles in smaller groups, such as at our workplace, in our family, in sports teams, and among our groups of friends. A mind that wishes to deceive others leads us to speak falsely, to trick others into believing what is not true. Speaking truthfully stems from a mind that respects others and wants to benefit them. So that's why I'm offended when people lie to me, because it seems to me they don't respect me. Yeah. Oh, you're, you can't handle the truth. You're a child. So I'll, I'll lie to you. Yeah. Or, sorry. I'm trying to adjust here so I can see the book better. Um, a, another element of, of truth-telling, it isn't, um, you know, that the motivation is to deceive somebody. Yeah. Or I should say in lying, the motivation, not in truth-telling. Um, the motivation is to deceive. So lying is kind of double trouble because we lie because we did something that we don't want other people to know about. So then the, the double part of it is what is the action we did 
that we want to keep covered up. So usually, not always, but usually the action we did that we don't want other people to know about is one of the, the ten non-virtues. It's usually, you know, some kind of unethical action we did, and now we want to cover up. Okay? So there, that's where the double is. You have the initial unethical action, and then you have the lying on top of it. Bill Clinton and his thing with Monica is a perfect example of that. You know, the first unethical thing, his sexual behavior with her, the second, lying about it to the public. Okay? So when we are tempted to lie, we need to stop and ask ourselves, why am I lying? Yeah? We usually phrase it so that I don't hurt somebody else's feelings. But let's look beyond that and ask ourselves, did I do something that was not very nice? And that's why I don't want somebody else to know about it, because it will hurt them, and they will lose faith and confidence in me. And if that's the reason I'm lying, then I need to really look at the first act I did that got me in the situation, as well as this motivation to cover it up. Because it would have been, uh, you know, if Bill had just said, yeah, I did it and I'm sorry, yeah, he would have saved the, everybody a lot of pain. If Kavanaugh, excuse me, I have to talk about politics sometimes. Okay. If Kavanaugh had just said, you know, I, I drank a lot in, in high school and college. I mean, all his friends said that. I drank a lot. I might have done something that, you know, blacked out, and I did a lot of stupid things, and I might have done something like that that I just don't remember. And if I did, I feel ashamed and I'm very regretful that she could, that she suffered so much because of that. And if he had said that, he would have saved the country a lot of pain. And he would have saved his family a lot of pain. I mean, imagine what his family went through. So, you know, trying to cover up the things that we did, you know, his, his reason is he, you know, he was ambitious. He wanted that seat on the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, if we have integrity and consideration for others, then sometimes the best thing is just to admit we did own what we did and apologize. And okay, you have to eat some humble pie, but you know what? Eating humble pie is good for us. It is. Because we often get very full of ourselves and very arrogant. And that leads us to be quite condescending. So admitting our mistakes publicly and regretting them publicly you know, makes us a lot more humble. And that is actually good for our dharma practice. The Tibetans have a saying that grass grows in the low valley, it doesn't grow on the high peaks. When we are humble, the dharma realizations grow. Because our mind, you know, we're receptive. When we are arrogant and proud on the high peaks, you know, with our nose in the air because we think we're so wonderful, the Dharma can't sink into our mind. Our mind's too polluted. Yeah? So I really try and remember this when people notice my faults. And anyway, I mean, why do we try and cover up our faults? 
because everybody else sees them anyway. Why are we pretending they aren't there when others know that they're there? Yeah. It's like saying, I don't have a nose. And walking around like this. You know, everybody knows we have one. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, when you live in a monastery, this is what you get used to. You know, people sometimes say, oh, you live in a monastery, you're running away from reality. Let me tell you, <laughs> you're not running away from reality. You're living with the same group of people 24-7. They know all your bad qualities. They know them in living cult color, and they've seen them many times. Yeah. So when we go around saying, oh, but, 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 no, I didn't do it, mm, it's somebody else's fault, you know? It's not going to fly. And so part of our monastic training is to learn to be transparent. And transparency saves so much pain. Okay? I remember one time, one of the nuns, uh, I don't know what happened, but there, were about, there was about a week there where she was in a foul mood. And everybody knew it because you know, she was just, she was angry all the time. And then we were having a community meeting where we go and we check up on how everybody's doing and we talk about any topics that need to be talked about. And I was thinking, oh, this is going to come up in the community meeting and somebody's going to say, you know, you said this to me and someone else is going to say, and you said that to me. But, what happened is as we were going around before the, the cross talk started, she said, I've been in a really bad mood for a week or two, and I know that all of you have been the recipient of my anger, and I want to apologize. She said that. Nobody brought up all the specific incidents that happened. They didn't need to. You know, because she owned her own anger. And, you know, that's all she needed to do. So she was transparent, and that restored the good relationship. Yeah. But when, you, you know, you, we start to deny things and we're not transparent, then it gets very difficult. Yeah. Because people know something's going on. Yeah. And often they've been the recipient, so better just to admit it and clean it up, you know, make amends, clean it up, and then the whole thing can, you know, be dropped. I mean, it, the, the, the cases, you look at, at, like with Paul Manafort, how much has he paid in legal fees? as this has been going on. Uh, you know, instead of just saying from the get-go, yeah, I had offshore accounts and I, I didn't pay taxes that I owed. You know? So instead, you know, he didn't admit that, so he, he, the government has taken millions of dollars from uh, his, his accounts. And I think, what is it, four or five of his six or seven uh, luxury houses the government's taken. You know, all they needed to do was just tell the truth. Yeah. So in, in many situations, it, it, it saves so much um, angst on people's part. Okay. Speaking the truth causes others to trust the leader. And again, remember, we are, our, we are all leaders in different situations. To trust the leader and have confidence in her decisions. This enables her to uh, be able to enact policies that will benefit them and they will follow those policies. Yeah. So if the leader tells the truth, the followers support that person, then that person can, you know, let help with policies that help those people, which make the, the public trust the leader more. 
and everybody prospers. However, if a leader tells even one lie, the followers will be skeptical and mistrustful of her words, motives, and behavior. How about if, how many lies is it up to now? I don't know. There's somebody who keeps track of them. Yeah. Even when she tells the truth in the future, if she's lied before, they won't believe her. Thus, it's essential to speak truthfully, especially when you are in a position of authority or leadership. Politicians and business people who lie, engage in fear-mongering, misappropriate funds, and so on, destroy the fabric of trust that a healthy society depends on. Is this Margaret Juno saying? Hmm? Is that Margaret Juno saying? Yeah. Well, this is... Um, it could, it could be Gel Subjay, it could be uh, Geshe Tenchok. And of course, I was the editor, so I, you know, I didn't put in modern examples, but I, you know, like they, Nagarjuna may have said, um, uh, you know, not keep stuff from the, the royal treasury and and keep it for yourself instead of sharing it with others. And so I put misappropriate funds. Mm. Yeah, it could be something like that, or maybe Geshe Tecto. I don't know if he knows that word, but that's what the meaning was. Yeah. We may think that small lies are unimportant or even beneficial if they help us to get our way or accomplish a project. Mm. Okay. Uh, this is Geshe Tekchuk now. I knew a young boy who thought telling the truth was foolish because when he told the truth to his teacher, his teacher would scold him for playing rather than studying. Whereas when he told a few little lies, the teacher would praise him and give him a sweet. <laughs> Lying definitely. <laughs> so the little boy thought, you know, well, why not? You know? But uh, lying definitely harms us as well as others. It destroys trust in relationships. Once damaged, trust is hard to restore. Nagarjuna is pointing out to the king, as well as to us, his readers, that we lie all too often. If you have a, pat a habit of telling lies, even little, little ones give it up. When you speak only the truth, engage in a path of truth, and always act on the basis of truth, then even if temporarily things may not go very well for you, in the long term you will get a true result. From truth comes truth. Traveling a true path, you will reach a true goal, a true result. Even if you have others other, uh, even, oh, if, even if you have other faults, uh, people will trust you if you tell the truth. Yeah. And trust is the basis of good relationships. To speak the truth is to speak uh, in a manner that is not deceptive. In other words, to not try and make somebody believe something that is counter to the facts. In addition to being factual, truthful speech has another important element. It must not harm another person or be spoken with the intention to harm someone. Our intention must be to benefit others in the long term. To tell a hunter where to find deer harms not only the deer, but also the hunter, for he creates the destructive karma by killing. A true statement must benefit others, and it must be told with the motivation to benefit. Saying what is factually accurate with the intention that others suffer is not truthful speech. Okay. Let's pause here. You may have some questions or comments, things to discuss a bit? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's what's required, that we speak carefully before we open our mouth. And that 
would really save us a lot of messes. Practice what's true, you know, nobody's going to be able to fault you for, for doing what is true, and you'll be able to accomplish your goal. It may take longer, and you may experience some inconveniences, but it enables you to, con you know, accomplish it because you haven't, at the end, done anything that is going to break trust or deceive others. Whereas if we um, are lying, yeah, then, I mean, this is the problem with lying, is people usually figure it out after a while. Yeah, and then we're in trouble. Yeah, if we lie to our boss or lie to colleagues, lie to our family members, lie to our friends, you know, after a while people say something isn't adding up here. And then, you know, even if we lie to get our way or to accomplish something, then we're going to, you know, bump into a lot of problems because somebody's going to catch our lie. And I think also lying is very stressful because you can't remember what, what you said to who. Yeah? And so did I tell this person this? Did I tell that person that? You, you get really confused. So, whereas if you tell the truth, it's the, you know, it's straight across. Yeah? I think that's a really interesting distinction that speaking the truth is only speaking the truth if you intend it in a beneficial way, as opposed to if you intend to hurt somebody. Yeah. But politically speaking, you know, these confrontations with saying, you're not speaking the truth. You know, they, they, I can't even you get so humble that but if you're, you know, desiring that people understand that the president is telling lies, you're not, you're, you're not um, conveying that with the intent to, um, you are conveying that with the intent probably to hurt the president or to make him accountable for what he does. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Now, as a, a good example, so... You said you gave two motivations there. One was to hurt the president. One was to make him accountable. Those are two different motivations. If you want to make somebody accountable, that's a good motivation. You know, if you, you say, you know, you need to be accountable because uh, what you're doing is harming others and what you're doing is creating negative karma for yourself also. So if I hold you accountable, it may help you to change your ways. That way, it's better for you karmically, and it's also better for the people that you're harming. So that's diff a different motivation than wanting to hurt him. It may wind up hurting him, but your motivation wasn't to hurt. The, the motivation is to restore truthfulness to that person and, and to society. Yeah? So I think it's good to hold people accountable. Yeah? And I think when we are good friends to people, we hold them accountable. Yeah? If, if we have a friend and we can see they're going down that slippery slope, deceiving something, acting, doing something, un you know, bad business deals or whatever they're doing with their family or whatever, and we see that, a good friend will sit down with that person and say, you know, I'm really concerned with, with how you're behaving and what the, re the results are going to be for you. Yeah? I mean, really, this is what a good friend does. A good friend calls us on our stuff so that we can uh, fix it, so that we can act differently. You know, if a friend comes to us 
and they're saying, oh, this person did this to me, and they did that to me, and they harmed me in this way, and that way, and the other way. And our friend may want us to say, oh, how dare they, you know? They can't act that way towards you. You never do anything wrong. And our friend wants us to take their side against the other person so that we also speak badly against the other person. That's not good friendship. Good friendship will say, it sounds like you're angry. Yeah, let's process your anger. What's making you angry? How can you see the situation so that you can calm down and, you know, not act this way? So a good friend will point things out. Yeah. So it's actually hard to be a good friend in that way because people want us to side with them against whoever they consider an enemy. And we're essentially saying, I'm not going to do that. And I'm more concerned with your mental state, which is anger right now, than I am with what this person did to you. Because what they did, they did, it's finished. But if you keep being angry and hold a grudge, that's going to ruin your life, and it's going to have an adverse effect on your future lives. And so sometimes, you know, really being a good friend is, entails actually risking your friend being furious at you. Yeah? Because you're, you're pointing something out to them that they don't want to see or you're holding them accountable for something they did. But if we're doing it with a good motivation, I mean, that is, that is real friendship, I think. That is really taking care of people. We're siding with them against their enemies and speaking badly about their enemies and, you know, engaging in harmful acts to harm their enemies. That harms the other person, it harms our friend, and it harms us. Yeah, useless. Okay. So this is why understanding karma is so important. <coughs> if you understand karma, then all of this makes sense. Because yeah. we realize it's not just this life's benefit. You know, it's creating the causes for future life's happiness. That's important too. Yeah? So, um, how do you approach encouraging people that are trying to work towards towards the end? Because for some, for some people, it's a struggle because it's a habitual behavior. And so if they are trying to be more mindful, um, I think sometimes it's important that people understand it's a process and it doesn't just sometimes take, you know, you don't just pick it up and suddenly So uh, the question is, what happens if, if somebody is a habitual liar? Yeah, and how do we speak to them about this? Because uh, if somebody has that habit of lying, they can't just change overnight. So still, I think it's good to point it out to them. And one of the things, you know, if they can look and ask themselves, why do I lie? You know, what's feeding this habit? That could really help them because there's probably some world, there's some view they have of how people will act towards them that is making them be deceptive. And if they could realize what their assumption is about how other people are or may treat them, then uh, that could help them recognize their lying. Because it, part of the habit of lying could just not be realizing that you're lying because you do it so often that you don't even think about it. Whereas if you start to ask yourself, okay, why do I say this? What's lying behind it? and you become more conscious of the motivation, and then you start working with your mental state that is uh, motivating these lies, 
then you start becoming more aware of them and you start transforming your mental state and then hopefully you have less reason to lie. My mother lied, my mother lied about her age my whole life. Huh. So when she passed, then I found out. Wow. Yeah, so you, a good example. Somebody always finds out your mother lied about her age your whole life. And when she died, you got, you saw the birth certificate inside. Why do you think she lied? She had this, I'll call it obsession, um, belief that it was so important in society's view to be younger, job stability, all these kinds of things. Old was bad, young was good. In, in the woman that looked just like Greta Garbo, so beautiful, so stunningly beautiful. Okay. <laughs> okay, so a woman who was very beautiful, who thought old is bad, young is good. And as you age and you lose your looks, then you don't know who you are anymore. She didn't lose her look. Okay, so let me summarize this. See, so you're saying that with Kavana, uh, you know, he wanted to preserve his reputation and his image. So what lies behind that is probably a sense, an issue with self-worth. Yeah? And, uh, and then in Buddhism, if we understand Buddha nature, then self-worth isn't an issue because we realize that we have the Buddha nature just by virtue of having a mind stream. It's never going to go away. Nobody can take it away. We can't destroy it. You know, so that foundation of self-worth is there in Buddhism. Then there's the issue of people raised in a culture in a Christian culture where you are born sinners. Okay? And you're born as a sinner, you're told from the time you're this big that you're a sinner, and that uh, if you don't confess or whatever, you're going to burn in hell. And of course that brings issues of self-worth. Yeah? And it brings fear. And what's interesting is to really, uh, to, uh, how to say, to really assimilate that thought into your, your being that you are worthwhile simply by the fact that you have a mind stream that has the Buddha nature. That takes a lot of time for people who grew up with the idea of original sin to accept deep inside. People feel very relieved to hear about it, but when you've heard from the time you were young this opposite view, you have to really spend time to recondition yourself and familiarize yourself with a whole different view of who human beings are. 
So it's not just uh, our worth, our Buddha nature, it's other people also have the Buddha nature. And so, therefore, we can't trash anybody. Yeah? You can say actions are bad, actions are harmful. Yeah? Speech is horrific, or whatever it is. But we can't say that a person who has the possibility to become a Buddha is evil. So the, these are really big cultural shifts in how we think that uh, those of us who grew up in one culture but are adopting Buddhism now have to make in our minds. I think especially in Kavanaugh's situation, and I'm talking about this broadly, not just focused on him, is that if you grow up in a family that is high status, you have a lot of privilege, you have entitlement, his family was well connected, it was wealthy, he went to a prep school, you know, where you go from the prep school to an Ivy League to a high paying job, and you have, you're raised with that sense of entitlement. So you have that sense of entitlement that I'm somebody special and I deserve this, but also eating away at you underneath is the thing of, you know, I'm, I'm not good, or I'm not good enough, or other people are better than me. So there's this conflicting thing inside of I'm no good, but I'm entitled to have everything. Yeah? So I, I think inside it, it could be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, fueled th the way he acted in the hearing, which was so astounding, to me at least, shocking. Yeah? Uh -huh. So I would like to um, raise the question about um, not so much someone like Kavanaugh or somebody in that situation, but what about the people who are accepting the lie? If we accept it for our own political expediency, are we somehow complicit in it? Are, are we creating our own negative karma? Yeah. I mean, if we know other people are lying and we go along and cover for them by lying and then we know we're telling something that's not true. But if we're not covering it, if we're just saying, oh, well, that's what he said. That's and what that's, he said, we're so We're passively it's the accepting truth. it. We're not actively lying, but we're passively accepting yeah. it. That it, seems to be as troublesome. Yeah, it depends on what's going on in your mind. If you really sincerely believe that person's telling the truth, then they succeeded in deceiving you. If you don't really believe it, but you like that person, and you go along with it, but underneath it you're not totally believing it, then, you know, there's, there's some kind of deception going on there. I, I wouldn't say that that person, if they don't verbally say or do something, I wouldn't say they're actively lying but they're deceiving themselves out of their own attachment to somebody by saying, well, I'm attached to that person or I want that person to be successful. I like what that person's doing. So I'm just going to overlook this other thing. Yeah. And I think that's where you have to reckon inside yourself when you're giving up your own standards um, in order to accomplish a worldly goal. And th this is what concerns me about uh, the evangelicals. Because I used to think, see evangelicals as people who try to keep good morality, at least their version of it. You know, they were sincere in that. 
But now I I I think uh, you know they're they're what did they say? They you're selling your soul to the devil. You know they know what's going on. It isn't a question of. Um, they know it, but they're willing to accept it in order that their policies be enacted. And that makes me sad because those are people who are religious, and I think people who are religious should set an example. Uh -huh. And just to follow up with what you just said and the question, how do you hold them responsible? So if you're uh, engaging with your friends on yeah. Facebook who... You know, it's hard, again, um, we can't go around saying, I have the right view and you have the wrong view and you've got to come to your senses. You know, that's just a little bit condescending, okay? Um, so you have to approach it from another direction, another way. Um, which would require some creative thinking on our part. You know, you can't just go to somebody and say, uh, you know, why are you supporting this when that's going on or whatever. Um, yeah, so I, I would do it in, in some way. Okay, so I'm just going to give an example here, and you can criticize me if you don't like what I say. Okay, so uh, I am anti-abortion and pro-choice. I'm both of them. Uh, because I don't, uh, I think abortion is killing, and, but I don't think the government should regulate this. I think it's not an issue they should, they should legislate about. Okay, because it's a situation where there's a lot of suffering on everybody's part and that the law cannot solve that suffering. Okay, having said that, if I'm going to be speaking to some people whose purpose in voting for particular people is uh, because they want uh, to outlaw, those politicians will outlaw abortion, or actually even, let, let's cancel that example, so that these politicians will, sh their motivation is to shut down Planned Parenthood, where, whereas Planned Parenthood does much more than abortions. It's about women's health and cancer screening and birth control, and birth control is a totally different thing that does not involve killing you know, and is good for people to practice in an overpopulated world. Okay, then, but then, because what puzzles me is the peop those people that are against birth control, but once the kids are born, they don't want to give any money for them, the kids to be healthy or to have a good education or, you know, anything. It's just, let's have all these babies and then afterwards, um, you know, we don't want to spend our money on good schools and good activities for kids, but we are willing to spend our money to build for-profit prisons, you know. Then, the way I would approach it, I, I haven't had the opportunity to try this, but I would maybe start talking about, I wouldn't say, lay it out like that. I would maybe start talking about, um, you know, what do you th what do you think about about how you know you're a Christian and you want people to do well and people are God's creations, so you want to benefit <coughs> them. How can we better benefit children in this country? What do you think children in our country need so that they can be happy and grow up and be good citizens, because you want that and I want that. And then maybe they'll probably say, well, health and education and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and if they say that, then I might say, oh, well, you know, you know, I personally find it 
puzzling because I believe in that too. I, then I personally find it puzzling why uh, you know our politicians are are uh, you know cutting things like you know food stamps and children's health. You know the EPA just uh, uh, you know they're not doing anything about children's environmental health and talk about the policies that the government's cut, cutting that are going to harm kids and say, you know, I'm really puzzled because you and I agree that this is what we need to do to help kids. And yet the government's doing that. You know, what can we do to help children and to help change governmental policies so the kids will do better? Okay? So I would do, do something like that, you know, finding uh, commonalities with the people. And so in this case, it would be common values of we all want children to do well and we all want um, lower crime, we all want kids to grow up to be good citizens. So establish that first and then bring in the other things. But um, try it and I don't know. So, you know, in a lot of situations, it's, uh, talking to people really involves establishing things that we agree with. And, um, and instead of seeing, okay, here's the problem. I'm on this side, you're on that side. We advocate different policies and so we're gonna fight. Instead of doing that, saying, here's the problem, I'm sitting here, you're sitting next to me, and we're both looking at the problem together. Yeah, so you look at the problem, you agree that this is a problem, and, you, and so you have that common value, and then you start talking about, okay, we have that value, how can we bring about what we both aim for? I think that that's that works much better than just fighting over policy. Uh huh. It's uh, it's so easy to look outwards and look at you know, look at the flyer and Jean, the Kavanaugh. Yes. But uh, I keep coming back to it is uh, these people are manifestations of a culture of which I am a part. Yeah. So. Uh, so I, I, I try to look at, okay, how am I involved? How do you know, uh, think karmically what, what's my karmic cause to be in this culture? Collectively, how do we all get here? And from where I am, what do I need to become to uh, nudge it in another direction? Yeah. Okay. So to, you're saying not just to you know talk about specific incidents or specific people in society, but to say that they're symptomatic of our culture at this time, and we are a part of this culture. So what? Uh, how did we get here in terms of our karma? How did we get here in terms of what we advocate in this life? and how we act in this life, and what can we do to remedy this situation. So, I, it's interesting to bring karma in on this point. Um, I know for myself, after 9-11, you know, when we were gearing up to go to war, I was sitting there thinking, I don't want to be in the middle of this. Yeah. I have no desire to hurt the people of, in Afghanistan. I have no desire for uh, retaliation and war. Um, also, I think what these people did was abominable. But I don't want to be caught in the middle of it. I just want to live my life. Yeah. And I, you know, I thought about people living in Nazi Germany and in the occupied territories 
who just want to live their lives. They don't want to be in the middle of a war. <coughs> or people in Syria, they just want to live their lives. They don't want to, they don't want to be a, live in a war-torn place. And yet, our karma put us there. Yeah? Didn't it? You know, it's the ripening of actions we've created that we live in, in this kind of situation. So, we accept that. Okay, I'm living with things that are unpleasant, you know, that I disagree with, but my it's a ripening of my causes that I myself created. So what do I have to do? As much as possible, I don't get sucked in by the, by the culture and, you know, go over to retaliation and this, this, that. I don't start acting like those people that this time, more than any time, I have to keep good ethical conduct. At this time, more than any other time, I have to speak about kindness and love and compassion and apologizing and making amends. You know? So it's, it's like, okay, the world is becoming degenerate. This is my way of doing something about it is I have to be hold myself very accountable you know not in a harsh way like children what do you think you're doing it doesn't do any good but you know really think about my values and do as much as i can to live according to them and when i blow it to admit it make amends restore what i believe in and go forward and to to share that view with other people in a way that will help them weather the storm, too. You know, because, uh, you know, our, uh, ha we're in this situation that we don't want to be and how we, you know, we can't take a rocket ship to the moon to, to be free of it. And even if we could, it's still the same people owning the rocket ship company that are doing this stuff down here. So the problem is just going to go to the moon, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I have to be clear about what my values and principles are and live them as much as I can. And when I make mistakes, repair them. Yeah. I mean, what other choice is there? Yeah, if you don't do that, what are the choice? Yeah, do we want to start acting like that? No. So if you don't want to start acting like that, what other choice do you have? You know, we work on ourselves and we become stronger, in, you know, in the values that, that we know are beneficial to people. And we just, I mean, we're in this situation. What do we do? We have to accept it. And here's where I think an understanding of emptiness can be very, very helpful because it's very tempting in when societies like this, we make everything so solid, you know? And, and we see how people are breaking up into groups of identities. You know, you know, we're the progressives, they're the, the Republicans, we're the whites, they're the blacks, we're the Mexicans, they're the Jews, we're the, you know, whatever, they're the whatever, okay? And uh, to see that, that that kind of mentality is not helping the situation. Yes, we live in a diverse country, and I think that's the beautiful part of it. Yeah. I'm not very patriotic, but, you know, I'm patriotic to the principles, <laughs> not to the reality. But the time that I do feel patriotic is when I stand in the line, when I've been abroad and I'm standing in line to go back into the U.S., and I'm standing in the line 
with the U.S. residents and, and permanent um, residents. And I look around and there's so many different kind of people speaking different languages that are different colors. That's when I feel proud to be an American. Yeah, because that's what I like about this country. You know, you can meet so many different kind of people. Yeah. So, you know, we just, we, we know that, we go forward, we do what we can in our own way. Yeah. And we don't always point the finger at other people because the things that they're doing, you know, it, we all have 84,000 afflictions. It's not that they have 84,100 and that's why they're doing what they're doing. We have the same 84,000. So until I attain the path of seeing, which is going to be a while, you know, I can't point the finger at anybody because if I were in certain situations, because I have the seeds of those afflictions in my mind stream, I might act like those people. So I can't put my nose in, in the air and say I'm morally superior or I'm superior in any other way. Because I have the same afflictions they do. Put me in that situation, I might think and, and act like they do. So this is what I mean by humility, you know? If we're humble in this way and see, you know, our own limitations because we're sentient beings, then we can, we can start to grow and we hold ourselves accountable. Yeah, because it's always so much easier to see what other people are doing, isn't it? Yeah, so I see you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this and you, and you should all change. <laughs> you should all change because when you change, then I'll be happy. When is that going to happen? Yeah, that everybody gets it, that I'm the center of the universe and they should change to do what I want. When is, are they going to understand that? Okay, so let's drop that expectation. I'm also very powerless because I didn't feel like I had any means to change situation that I I didn't really know how to deal with my attachment to the emotions but I also didn't know what I could do realistically to make it better so you found with the whole Kavanaugh thing and the whole what's coming out in the Me Too movement that you just became so angry and at the same time you felt powerless to, to do anything to, to change it yeah when I look at, at, at Christine Blasley, and I'm projecting things right now, they may not be true, she didn't appear to me to be angry. Did she appear to you to be angry? Yeah? To me, she didn't seem angry. She, she was hurt. And often when we're hurt, we go to the next step, which is anger. But I didn't hear her speaking angrily. But she spoke. And what she did changed a lot of things. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, you know, people are saying now, well, this there's a lot of uh, what backlash against me too so maybe it's just going to fade away or maybe it will become more powerful i think we make it more powerful and who's going to make it more powerful us yeah who's going to speak up for not harming other living beings I was hearing one, somebody at our monastic conference, you know, was talking about, you know, the men be, becoming leaders with other men against harming 
uh, women and against harming children. And then this, it was a monk who said it, and he said, but you know, men also harm each other, and that's called war. So if we can change this into a broader thing about non-harmfulness of any living being, we can keep it focused on women, we can keep it focused on kids, but extend it broader so it's non-harmfulness to anybody. Yeah? And we're not powerless. We're powerless if, if we just sit and get depressed. <laughs> yeah? Depression makes us powerless. But compassion gives us power. And if we have if we have compassion, not only for the victims, but also for the perpetrators. So we're not just pointing the finger at every man who did this and say, you're a scum and you're going to prison and may you burn in hell there. You know, we're not talking like that. You know, I don't want anybody to suffer, but I want them to change their behavior. And if prison makes somebody change their behavior, then I'm for it. Okay? So, we, we aren't, we don't have to be angry in order to speak out against injustice. You know? And His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a perfect example of that. You know? Because uh, you look, uh, around 1949, 1950 was when the Palestinians uh, lost their land. Uh, around the same time, that's when the Chinese Communists invaded Tibet. Since that time, you know, the Palestinians have used violence a lot to make their cause known, and a lot of people have been killed and are still being killed in the Tibet, and they still don't have their, their own country. In the Tibetan situation, His Holiness is telling people not to hate the communist Chinese. Yeah, there's been no, um, uh, what do you call it, kidnappings and terrorism. The only thing that some Tibetans have done is self-immolated which is really sad. I don't agree with that either. And, but the Tibet, so what I'm getting at is many more people have been killed in the Palestinian um, aspiration for self-government than have been killed in the Tibetan um, aspiration for their self-government. And both things have been happening uh, started around the same time, and neither of them have been successful. But with one, many people have lost their lives. With the other, where His Holiness is always teaching compassion and nonviolence, very few people have lost their lives. So my point of saying this is that compassion can be a very strong motivator for correcting social problems. So we speak up, and we point things out, but we don't need to be angry and we don't need to blame people with a, a harsh intention. But there's definitely something we can do. I mean, if you think about it in, in the case of sexual assault, haven't things changed since five years ago? Yeah. yeah. Don't you think things have changed? People are talking about it now. You know, and that's making some men think. So it has changed. Why has it changed? Because people have been willing to speak up. So I think, you know, what Christine Blasey did was very courageous, and I think it will have a lasting effect if we all support it and broaden it so it's not harmfulness to anybody. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, makes some sense. Yes. I have a comment. Um, I think 
comment going back a little bit when we were talking about mind. And I was thinking the different perspective of as a listener ourselves. Um, when we hear someone say something and we think they're not telling the truth, that for us also to be able to check on what is our perspective, what is our experience, because maybe we don't believe them because we think, oh, they can't be true. And there's so much, you know, that. But it can't be true. So I think it's important to check our own perspective. And also, do we have a tendency towards habitual suspicion? Uh, so really check it out instead of just blatantly saying they're lying. Yeah. Okay. Now, very good point, you know. Instead of when somebody says something that we disagree with, saying they're lying, check out what is our perspective, what our biases may be in the way we're looking at things. Yeah. And then look at the situation. Okay, so we're going to pause for lunch now. <laughs>